Hey everybody, welcome back to the Harder News Recap for the week. Good news, we do not need light for our shoot here in Shenzhen in China. Bad news, it is 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, just to get the elephant out of the room, what I need you all to do is count the sweat droplets throughout this video. And whoever gets the most accurate count at the end, I will heart your comment. There's, there's no other prize. That's, but at least it sends you a notification when you get a heart now. Okay, so it's worth something. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the Asus Ascent GX10, which is a collaboration with NVIDIA for the GB200 Grace Blackwell chip. So that's an ARM NVIDIA CPU and their GPUs. Uh, that's a mini PC, a mini PC. There's also a Linux MFG alternative. So now we can look at more or less bullshit frame rate numbers in multiple operating systems, but at least it's spreading to be more agnostic for GPUs. Uh, additionally, some new cases. So Fractal has one, Corsair has one, and Silverstone, all three have interesting cases coming out and shown in the last week. NVIDIA has just become the world's first $4 trillion company. Uh, and we've got a couple of other stories for the week. So let's get started. Honks out for NVIDIA being a $4 trillion company. He's an investor. Before that, this video is brought to you by ID Cooling and the frozen A720 cooler. The A720 air cooler performed well in our testing last year. The A720 is a relatively high-end, dual 140mm air cooler with seven heat pipes. We found the use of larger fans can be beneficial to acoustic performance given the thermals, although you'll want to check your case for compatibility given the taller nature of the cooler and its fans. ID Cooling uses an all-black look for its A720 and includes mounting hardware for all modern sockets. Learn more at the link in the description below. All right, first up, why are we here? You don't get to know. We'll tell you in a couple weeks. Uh, we have a really interesting story here. We've been all over China and putting together a large, probably three or so hour documentary similar in length and run time into our tariffs video, but a totally different topic. So we're out here for that. Uh, we're traveling around a lot and we're shooting hardware news on the go here. We're right now in Huachanbei in Shenzhen, which is where the SCG e-market is that we filmed several years ago. For the news, so Asus is launching a pre-built mini PC. This has the NVIDIA combination of CPU and GPU. It's Grace Blackwell GB200 Silicon, and that is called the Ascent GX10 mini PC. And it's made by Asus, and it has NVIDIA hardware in it, and it's small, so it's going to be unbelievably expensive, but there's no price yet. The ARM-based system has 128 gigabytes of unified memory and notes a chip-to-chip -chip approach with a claimed five times the bandwidth, that's their quote, of PCIe 5.0. That's according to Asus's marketing. Via the Tech Power Up database, the GB200 chip has 18,432 CUDA cores, 576 TMUs, and 73,728 FP16 units for half precision. The NVIDIA spec site for the GB200 NVL72 there's a, there's a lot of honking going on. We're going to keep going. Okay, that wasn't cool. Now they're sneezing. The NVIDIA spec site for the GB200 NVL72 lists a single GB200 Grace Blackwell so-called super chip as being one CPU and two GPUs in its original configuration. Although this is a mini PC of sorts, it isn't targeted for typical desktop processing and is instead focused on so-called AI tasks. The Ascent GX10 mini PC currently does not have an MSRP, but again, it's Asus, NVIDIA, and small. So as earlier, it's gonna be expensive. Up next, Linux gets an MFG alternative. So this is the lossless scaling solution where lossless scaling exists already on Steam for Windows. It is a, it does DLSS, FSR type of upscaling, and it also has frame generation, but that has now been ported by the community to Linux as well. Lossless scaling is a tool available on Steam to bring DLSS and FSR style upscaling to more games on Windows and GPU agnostic. This includes its own version of frame generation with frame multipliers. Lossless scaling also works with emulators, like for its frame generation, and has scaling options including LS1, FSR, NVIDIA image scaling, and several more listed on the Steam page. Unlike DLSS though, lossless scaling can be used with more GPUs. The intent is that eventually it can be used with anything. Lossless scaling and lossless scaling frame generation, or LSFG, already exist, but the news here is that they've been ported to Linux by the community with the author of it writing on GitHub this, quote, this document simply describes the psychological torture I went through to make this project work, end quote, describing forcing LSFG functionality with native Vulkan. And on that note, 
Psychological Torture is the name of my NVIDIA AI music cover band. I play the tiniest violin for consumers. Now, projects like this are also why we thought it was so unbelievably stupid that NVIDIA wanted to see MFG4X on charts against cards without it, because if we're playing games where we just arbitrarily multiply the frame rate, we might as well use loss of scaling 20x while we're at it. Now, the best news here is more Linux support, where we've been talking about Linux more and more since really the advent of the Steam Deck with SteamOS on it, uh, and seeing increasing support on that, whether or not you would use the loss of scaling frame generation port on Linux, it is good to see that development. And uh, one of the things we've been talking about with SteamOS especially and the Proton layer that it uses is that actually in several instances, frame time pacing is better in some of the Linux operating systems that we've tested at least, not sure about everything, but in theory stuff with Proton should behave similarly. Uh, and the frame time pacing is actually more consistent in the tests that we've run over the years. So the hope is that as general compatibility widens, especially for non-gaming software, uh, it ends up being a potentially more viable solution than Windows, which is filled with flow. Up next, NVIDIA recently became the world's most valuable company and the first com well, again, it's, it's gone up and down a few times, but again, and it's the first company to cross the $4 trillion market cap threshold. On July 9th, CNN wrote, quote, NVIDIA stock rose 2.5% after the market opened on Wednesday to hit an intraday record high that pushed its market value above the $4 trillion mark, end quote. Yahoo Finance noted that Apple came close at one point, reaching $3.915 trillion on December 26th, 2024. But the company's stock started falling as a result of then potentially inbound tariffs. Apple is now valued at approximately $3.1 trillion at the time of our reporting, and it proves that the Apple Apple does, in fact, fall far from the four trillion dollars. Four trillion dollars. Do you, do, you, do you see what I did? There? Nvidia has been able to ride high off of its investments in so-called AI and the shareholder frenzy surrounding the next field of tulips. Bloomberg estimates that Nvidia CEO Jensen Huang has become the tenth richest person in the world with a net worth amounting to approximately 140 billion dollars. We're going to be rich. Now, to help contextualize that absolutely absurd amount, that is roughly two Activision Blizzard purchases. And we won't even get into how many Louisiana purchases that is. I spent like, probably, probably spent like 15 minutes trying to double check the, the conversion and the inflation. And it just, I realized it was probably not a good use of my time. So someone else can figure it out in the comments. Jensen Huan is among the richest and most powerful people in the world, to the extent that he's attending dinners with the president that cost $1 million per person. And it's a good reminder of just how big NVIDIA has become. At this point, NVIDIA is now one of the largest companies, period. Uh, but in the tech space, it is the most dominant, absolutely. And actually, even here in Shenzhen, we were walking around uh, some of the very large tech markets here that we've done tours of in the past, and it is all NVIDIA. There's a little bit of AMD, saw some 9070s, some 9070 XTs, uh, but for the most part, it's NVIDIA all the way, and Intel is basically not present on their part, their side of things. But NVIDIA has come a long way. It's grown up as a company. I, Seems like just yesterday that they were trying to charge $250 for an eight gigabyte GPU. That, that actually was just yesterday, but okay, you get the point. Up next, Corsair's Frame 5000D that we saw at Computex is now launching. This is part of the Frame 4000D family, but scaled up in size. It's a different case from the similarly named 5000D non-frame from several years ago. The Frame 5000D has a similar ventilated front panel style to the Frame 4000D that we reviewed previously, using Corsair's self-named... The Frame 5000D uses Corsair's self-named 3D mesh. To their credit, it does actually have depth and uses Y-shaped designs to reinforce the panel while increasing the porosity. The new case is 556 by 250 by 542 millimeters with the RS ARGB SKU, including four RS140 ARGB fans and the non-ARGB model, including four RS140 fans. The case can fit up to two 200 millimeter fans in the front and up to a 420 millimeter radiator, depending on the position. Corsair's blog post highlights that the 5000D uses Corsair's new cheese grater motherboard tray technology which we assume is their next trademark filing that you can find in the USPTO. And its primary purpose is to give mounting options for cable management anywhere and 
Wait, it, it actually does have a name. They call it the Rapid Route 2.0. Wow, Corsair's got a name for everything. It's, they really have a lot of marketing people on staff. The Frame 5000D also comes after Corsair showed us some of its 3D printed case accessories and parts at Computex, all of which use the frame system that's supposed to be somewhat standardized for case core components to improve modability. Up next, Fractal Design has announced its new Epic case. Uh, we're planning to review this one once we get back. New case on the market though, the case ranges from $110 to $130 is uh, using some of the Fractal North tooling, and the cheaper of these runs non-RGB fans and a steel side panel rather than tempered glass. The case includes three LCP blade fans, making them expensive in the Momentum 12 series, and the case has a ventilated mesh front and top panel. The company says that the ATX case supports up to a 240mm top radiator, up to 360 front, and supports video cards up to 372mm long. It also features a fabric pull tab for its top panel and has a laser-etched aluminum badge. Overall, Fractal says that the case measures 447 by 215 by 469 millimeters, and currently the black and white variants are retailing for $110, but the case scales up to $130 with RGB fans and tempered glass. Up next, Silverstone has launched its new Seta H2 case, which can support up to 15 drives for storage, so you could install about two Call of Duties on that. And the Seta H2 is branded a workstation chassis and uses what now feels like an older approach to case design. The combination of the drive cage, the sub power supply shroud, the top power supply shroud, and the back of the motherboard tray in total supports the 15 drives. Board support is up to SSI EEB, and it has eight PCIe slots at the back of the case. The front of the case uses an interesting wraparound mesh that extends onto both side panels, pulling partway back along the area where the drive cages are mounted. This should help with a few things, but the main one would be ventilating the case when there's a wall of hard drives or SSDs taking up space and causing impedance. The case can fit two drives in the bottom front, below the power supply shroud, two on top of the shroud, seven in front of the case, and four behind the motherboard tray. Three and a half inch support is up to 11, with the possibility of one extra one on top of that by taking two of the two and a half inch slots if we understand their graphic correctly. The remaining four, assuming the optional slot isn't converted, would be for two and a half inch drives. Air coolers are supported up to 188 millimeters in height, making the case relatively deep for workstation use, and that may help workstation users avoid liquid cooling while still maintaining a higher cooling capacity. Although personally, I would say liquid cooling would be great right about now it is really f***ing hot. It is, there's, there's not gonna be any liquid left. I'm gonna be uh, like a dehydrated, I'm gonna be a raisin after this, just totally dehydrated, I think. It's really hot in Shenzhen. The case is currently running for $210 on Amazon. And up next, there's a rumor about Intel planning to release a 192 core SOC in 2026. Twitter user at x86 dead and back, presumably named after Intel, at this point, posted a supposedly leaked image detailing an interesting upcoming Intel SoC if the leak is accurate. According to the leak, it would be called the Diamond Rapids solution, and it'll be on Intel's 18A process. It'll have four compute tiles per CPU, and will max out at 192 cores. The rumored CPU will supposedly support a new platform called Oakstream, and if we're reading the leak right, the platform will have two variants that support either 8 or 16 DDR5 memory channels per SOC. It'll also reportedly support PCIe Gen 6. And finally, the SOC will allegedly be a 500 watt part. Up next, export bands. This is a fun topic for here. We're gonna, we're gonna play my favorite game of which government list does Steve end up on by the end of 2025, the US or China? In this news item found via Bloomberg and CNBC, the US government has removed restrictions that limited chip design software companies from exporting their products to China. The export controls originally went into effect in May and impacted companies like Synopsys, Cadence, and Siemens AG. At the time, EE Times described the US government's export rules as, quote, a significant escalation in Washington's efforts to impede China as technological advancement, particularly in developing advanced semiconductors, end quote. Less than two months later, Synopsys, 
Cadence and Siemens AG separately announced that the U.S. Department of Commerce had recently lifted these export restrictions. Siemens AG said it has, quote, resumed sales and support to Chinese customers, end quote. Further, Synopsys said, quote, it is working to restore access to the recently restricted products in China, end quote. These companies are part of the electronic design automation or EDA market and sell software and tools that are imported for semiconductor creation and design. The U.S. Department of Commerce, as far as we're aware, has not further commented on this. Quick weather update. We're adding these to Harvard News now. Good news. It still feels like 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius. Bad news. My phone says severe weather alert, excessive heat. Up next, following the recent Microsoft layoffs, which impacted roughly 9,000 employees, Xbox Game Studios publishing executive Matt Turnbull recently came under fire after allegedly suggesting on LinkedIn in a post which has since been deleted that Microsoft's laid off workers should turn to AI to deal with the devastating situation. Quote, these are really challenging times and if you're navigating a layoff or even quietly preparing for one, you're not alone and you don't have to go it alone. He wrote from his ivory tower surrounded by sycophants chanting, yes, this is a good idea to post on LinkedIn. And also, I would like to point out that going to chat GPT does not make it less alone. That is possibly the most alone you could be. It's like, it's like, talk to AI that we've created to replace you for emotional support. Isn't it great? And, we've, and Microsoft has created the full circle. They, they created the supply and they created the customers for it. He added, quote, I've been experimenting with ways to use LLM AI tools like ChatGPT or Copilot to help reduce the emotional and cognitive load that comes with job loss, end quote. One of the prompts he suggested for laid off employees and what should be on LinkedIn Lunatics was to write this to GPT, quote, I'm struggling with imposter syndrome after being laid off. Can you help me reframe this experience in a way that reminds me of what I'm good at, end quote. Just, I don't I don't really have anything to I don't have any anything to report on here other than I Jimmy I think wrote that yeah Jimmy wrote this story I'm just reading the rest of that quote now and my first response is Jesus Christ like, this is this is what we're doing this is a this seems really bad this this does not seem this in fact seems the opposite of good I'm not sure I like this. I don't know that I like the future. It's worth mentioning that ChatGPT and Copilot, which were both mentioned in this completely sane LinkedIn post where sane people go, are projects funded by Microsoft. So it's advertising. The irony here is that some of Microsoft's recent job losses may have been caused by these things. Uh, and I don't have anything good to say about any of that. So we're gonna end this one here and check back for our coverage from out here in Shenzhen. So quick kind of preview for some of you, but we've done a lot uh, so far on this trip. I think we're gonna probably end up with maybe 10 videos coming out of it. There's one big one that's gonna be like the three or so hour documentary that we can't talk about the topic yet. But some of the other cool videos include uh, more walking through SCG e-market and buying some stuff. So I picked up a couple of products that don't really exist much in the US and we're gonna do tests on those. Uh, we also went up to Zhengzhou in China and that was like a six hour high speed rail ride for part of the story. We visited a GP repair shop and shot a really cool video there. Not gonna again share exactly what it is yet, but some modifications of GPUs were involved. We'll leave it at that. Really fun though. Uh, and uh, we've also hopped around for example, uh, we came here from Hong Kong, actually, and we were at Golden Computer Arcade there for a different video. So a lot of really cool stuff coming up. Check back, as always, for all of that. And subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. And uh, your purchases on the store or support on Patreon will pay for probably about 20 bottles of water for me as soon as we walk off of this platform. And even more for Tannen. We'll drop in the clip of him with the the fan that I bought. How do you like the fan? It was a smart purchase. It's been coming in handy all trip. <laughs> it was a good purchase, right? Absolutely. It was a good purchase. Thank we, you, Steve. We, we said thanks, Steve. All right, we'll end it there. See you all next time.